I'm really excited about this new series where I'll be looking at institutional grade risk management techniques that can also of course be used by retail traders. Incorporating these into your overall strategies could have a profound impact on your reward to risk ratios and help to deliver more consistent profits. This is a series you really don't want to miss. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. If you're a talented trader looking to attract investor capital to your strategies, DarwinX is the fastest way for you to do this. We enable traders to raise third party investor capital and then charge success fees on high watermark profits. Additionally, DarwinX itself invests in its traders with our seed capital allocation program that allocates up to 90 million euros per year in successful trading strategies. So if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link here or you can find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. All traders hopefully incorporate some level of risk management into their trading and their processes. But for many retail traders, this often starts and ends with the use of a stop loss. And yes, stop losses are of course valuable tools at an individual position level. But what far fewer retail traders do is measure and manage the risk of their portfolio as a whole. And by manage, I mean using quantitative risk assessments to determine if specific trades should be allowed to open or not, based on whether they reduce or increase portfolio risk. Incorporating these techniques can have a profound impact on your equity curve, as can be seen here. And that's what this series is all about. Let's make a start. So what we're looking at here are two equity curves that are from exactly the same trading strategy, so the same rules, the same list of assets being traded, but the one on the left shows the equity curve when there are no portfolio risk management techniques being used, and then on the right, we see the equity curve when that portfolio risk is being actively managed. This new series follows on very well from the last episode of the previous series, where we looked at portfolio diversification and correlation. And this covered some of the main techniques in order to achieve a diversified portfolio, such as incorporating multiple asset classes, multiple assets within a class, and also timeframes and different types of strategy. And I also provided links to previous videos that I've done in terms of measuring correlation, because it's absolutely essential that you're able to do this in order to inform your decisions. But why do we need to measure correlation? Well, it's so that we can avoid over correlation within your portfolio. And so this series now builds on that previous foundation but will provide a lot more information because in order to reduce risk most effectively, it's not just about avoiding correlation. And so we're now going to look at the more advanced technique of avoiding excessive portfolio risk. Now, let's just be clear about what we mean by this. There are multiple levels of managing risk. And at the very fundamental level, we should be doing this at an individual position level to make sure that each position doesn't cause too much risk. But what we're talking about is portfolio risk. And these two combined will be the major components of your risk management strategy. And so now let's take a closer look at portfolio risk and what this entails. Firstly, it's quite different from individual position risk. With individual positions, the kind of things we'll be incorporating to manage risk are stop losses, 
ensuring that we're not risking more than a certain percentage of the account equity on an individual position and so on. But portfolio risk looks at all of the positions simultaneously. And one of the reasons we did the foundation work previously around correlation is that a major part of this will be to measure the overall correlation of the portfolio because that will be proportionate to the level of risk. And more specifically, a highly correlated portfolio poses high risk because if the market moves strongly against you, then because your positions are correlated, they'll all move against you at the same time. But there are additional factors that we will look at in this series. And one of those is volatility of the individual assets within the portfolio. The more volatile those highly correlated assets are, the higher the level of risk. And of course, what we then need to do when we have measured the risk is to act on that and use it to inform decisions about our trading. And in its simplest form, this will be a binary decision of whether a new trade should be allowed to open or not. Or a slightly more sophisticated approach might be that we will allow a trade to open, but the position size for that trade might be reduced in order to maintain a satisfactory level of risk. And we'll look at all of these concepts in a lot of detail during this new series. Now, let's return to the two equity curves that we looked at previously. You'll notice if you look at the Y axes here, that both strategies end up making approximately the same amount of profit. So the compound annual growth rate figures will be very similar for these two approaches. However, the main differences are the drawdowns that are experienced. And on the left here, with no portfolio risk management, those drawdowns are significantly bigger than those on the right. So let's take a look at a few quantifiable metrics for each of these curves. Firstly, on the left, the compound annual growth rate over the maximum drawdown percentage is 0.824. And those of you that have seen my previous videos know that I'm quite a large fan of the compound annual growth rate over mean drawdown or average drawdown. And when performing optimizations, this tends to be my preferred metric. And in this instance, this scores 4.2. But I do feel that when you're doing this type of study where the specific aim is to reduce risk, then compound annual growth rate over maximum drawdown can actually be a better measure to perform your comparisons. Now, just one more metric in terms of the total number of trades that were executed in order to deliver this equity curve on the left, that was just a little over 25,000. Now let's compare the metrics with the curve on the right. Well, we can see that the compound annual growth rate over maximum drawdown has increased from 0.8 to just over 1.3. So that's a fairly significant improvement in the equity curve. The improvement in CAGR over the mean drawdown is even more. Here it's almost three times better at 11.1. But take a look at the number of trades. This is reduced from 25,000 to just over 15,000. And that is a direct result of the portfolio risk being actively managed in this second scenario, which as you can see, actually prevented a fairly large number of trades from opening. And of course, it was those trades that would have meant more risk being put onto the portfolio. But what is it about the individual positions that on the left-hand side here contributed to those large drawdowns? Well, that is going to be the topic of the next episode, where I'm going to look at one of the main causes of excessive risk and the associated drawdowns that that tends to lead to. And then in the episode that follows that, we're going to get into the numbers of how to calculate and measure portfolio risk because those quantifiable measures 
are what we need in order to take action to inform our decisions. So that's the first episode of the new series under our belts. And I hope that you can see the value and the potential for this type of approach and how you might incorporate that into your own trading strategies. If so, then you need to continue watching and the next episode should be released within the next couple of days. If it's already available, you'll see a link to it top right now. But now, until next time, trade safe.